Um, hello, welcome everyone to today's BOHS webinar. So I'm Mary Cameron. I'm the Midlands Regional Coordinator for the British Occupational Hygiene Society. And today we'll be talking about noise risk reduction and how to apply best practice by combining advances in PPE, noise control and audiology. We have three superstar speakers with us today. These three are leaders and innovators in their fields. We have Rob Shepard, who specializes in health surveillance. There he is. Peter Wilson, who is the guru for noise assessment and control. And David Greenberg, who is an expert in innovative PP. So their presentations will show exactly where and why the current approach has failed, and they will provide details of the necessary changes that you guys listening can take away with you today. Uh, so implementing these revised best practices can reduce hearing damage by over 75%, and these changes can often be made at no extra cost compared with current hearing conservation programs, which is wonderful. Uh, those in the audience will be occupational hygienists, occupational health professionals, health and safety professionals, or you know, working in, in a relatable field. And we in our professions can often see workers suffering with unnecessary hearing damage and related health hazards such as increased risk of dementia, cardiovascular disease, and hypertension. This is a risk that is 100% preventable, provided that an updated and more effective approach is adopted, which is the topic of this webinar. Uh, so it's of absolutely no surprise at all that this has turned out to be such a popular webinar and also the, the glowing reputation of our three presenters, <laughs> obviously. Um, who had a lot of people sign up for, for you guys. Um, and, and this is just such an incredibly important topic. So well, whilst I'm um, uh, able to hold your, your, your ears for a moment, I just want to plug in here that um, I, I want to mention that this webinar was done with collaboration uh, with the UK Hearing Conservation Association. So that's UK HCA. Uh, this is a multidisciplinary organi organization formed to bring together like-minded professionals who are passionate about protecting the nation's hearing health. The association provides a useful model in breaking down silos across disciplines to come together to challenge for change. And I think this is well represented in the speakers we have today. So wonderful. Uh, now, before we get stuck in, um, I think I've already said it enough, but if everybody could just remember to keep their video and audio turned off, unless you're a presenter, of course, it's just to ensure there's no uh, disruptions uh, throughout. We we do have a capa capacity to press the mute all button, but it just causes a bit of a hassle to then have to, um, the presenter would have to unmute themselves. So if you please, audio and video off, uh, <laughs> as beautiful as you all are. Right. Um, and so, you know, this is being recorded. This will be uploaded to YouTube ASAP. So anything you want to hear again today or that you, you've missed, uh, please uh, just just check on YouTube. So now all that uh, being said, we have a little bit of a surprise for you guys. We have a quiz. So <laughs> before we dive into the presentation, we just thought it'd be nice to wake everybody up a bit. Just get everyone engaged and ready to learn. Uh, so we're going to start this off a little poll. Lee's going to bring it up right now. Here we go. So I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Lee, so you can intro how this works. Yep, so nice and easy. Um, if everyone's got a phone next to them, um, if you just open up any web browser on your phone and go to the website in the left there, vbox.app, and then when prompted, if we just pop in that nine digit code there, um, I will start the session so I can see uh how many there you go so if i open the first question so there's first question so yeah if you just go vbox.app enter in the nine digit code and we'll have um your first question see 21 people are are already very much on it there so if you just join and then mary if you just want to say when um when you want me to run the the answer for this one and we've got four sure, questions yeah. in total just uh pop in the chat if you have any issues and if somebody can just monitor that just to see if we can Let's, help that it should be let's give it a little bit longer for this first one just to give people time to sign on and yeah yeah for sure 
Yeah, I, I'll read the question as well. Uh, might as well. <laughs> so uh, the first question is, in a recent article in the British Medical Journal, how much does prolonged exposure to environmental traffic noise increase the risk of suffering from dementia? Hmm. 5%, 10%, 15%, or 25%? Oh, those numbers are still shooting up. So we'll, we'll reveal the answers, but um, we won't discuss it here and now because the presentation's coming up. We'll, we'll discuss it essentially, so. <laughs> yeah, give me guys maybe another 10 seconds or so. Oh, let's see if people are logging in. I do like VVox, it's quite a quite easy, isn't it? User friendly. Yeah, it's it's done really well when we've used it in the past. Oh, that's excellent. All right. So you me pull it? I always feel bad because like, oh, we're cutting somebody off. Oh no. Great. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah, let's call it. Let's call it. <laughs> There's, there's wow. Third, so, yeah. so pretty even on. It's still, it's still adjusting there. Oh gosh. Well, the correct answer is twenty five percent. Yeah. A lot of ten and fifteen percent there. Goodness. Well, it just shows how much we're going to learn today. Yeah. Right. Twenty five percent. Then we'll move on to the next question. Excellent. Okay, you guys, ready? So if you use passive hearing protection at work that gives you trouble hearing, how much more likely are you to have an accident? Hmm. Numbers have to be flying up. Yeah. Guys are getting quick. Excellent. All right, give five more seconds or so. Oh, somebody is unmuted. If you could just ensure you're all muted, please. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, let's go for it. What's the let's answer? So the results there. So majority on 50% there. Um, <laughs> Oh, which was 100 percent so oh. like I say, we'll do that in more detail during the, the presentation so we're going to question three there yeah. this one and then one more yep so when comparing lab and field measured attenuation for earplugs what is the average field attenuation you should expect as a percent of the lab measurement mm -hmm. Good way to wake everybody up. I like it. We we need to do this for every webinar. I think like, it's a good idea. <laughs> hmm. All right, we're getting there. Maybe five more seconds. If somebody, uh, if you could just mute yourself, please. Thank you. So I don't have access to the presenting the screen and being able to mute people on the side, but I'll um speakers are ready. I can I can get back on that. So yeah, just uh two there we go. I'll just I'll show the answers here now if you're ready. So show results there. So another quite a common majority on 52%. And what's the answer? The answer is 25 percent. <gasps> So far, majority hasn't gotten the correct answer. My goodness. Hopefully, but lots of and then the final question. Yeah. So if you use noise control measures to reduce workplace noise levels from 90 dB down to 90, or sorry, 98 <laughs> dBA down to 92 dBA, uh, by how much have you reduced the hearing damage risk of the staff in the area? So, 98 to 92. Ooh. All right, this is the last one. 
unfortunately, no prizes for anybody uh, who gets all four right. Maybe a virtual round of applause. <laughs> best you can do. Excellent. Maybe five more seconds or so. Looking good. Cool. So I'll show the results on that one. So yes. majority. Oh. Oh, switch around a bit, a few last minute changes. So still, I think still 75% wins out on that one. And the correct answer for the last one was 75%. So very strong. So got it. Great. Okay. That's Perfect. So that ends the, the, <laughs> the quiz portion of the webinar. So um, I'll just stop sharing my screen there. And if we, um, I think, is it Peter? Fabulous. Yes. Share we're screen. I'll just mute myself right? again into Peter. Um, just before you start, Peter, Peter I was just going to say to everybody, whilst you guys are listening, there's the chat box. It's that little bubble, you know where to find it. Um, so if you if you do want to drop comments, questions, get a discussion going, um, I'm going to be keeping track of the questions throughout, so no, none will get missed. And we're going to hold Q&A till the very end of the three presentations. Um, and from here, I'm going to hand over to Peter. Peter's going to introduce himself and the other speakers. So Take it away. <laughs> Hang on, slight technical problem here. There we go. Can you see my screen? Hello? Yep, no yes. worries. Okay. No worries. OK, my name is Peter Wilson. I'm the Technical Director of the Industrial Noise and Vibrations Centre. I'd first like to thank BOHS and particularly Mary Cameron for setting all this up. Um, the genesis of this is that I, I set up the INVC 35 years ago and we run, developed and run the IOSH competency, competency, noise competency training courses and we see what industry does a lot and we experience it as, as noise and vibration consultants. And the result is unbelievably depressing. Uh, in the last 35 years since I set up INVC, nothing much has changed. Noise control is still determinedly based on 19th century technology. Um, sound level meters have changed. They've got more sophisticated, but more importantly, they're much lighter, so you don't have to wear safety shoes in case you drop them on your foot. And in terms of hearing protection, Yes, there's a wider range, there are more colors, uh, but performance-wise, nothing significant until very recently. It's a bit, you know, oh, I see, sir, you have uh, chosen the Versace earmuff. Interesting, it has hamster skin covering on the pads to give you that caress on your cheeks to make you wear it. But the performance, sir, uh, it's the same as the ordinary model. Nothing has changed and people are going deaf unnecessarily. So uh, I ran into Rob uh, Shepard uh, and um, David uh, Greenberg a few years ago at various meetings and things, and they were kindred spirits, just utterly frustrated by the lack of change in the way that hearing is managed due to lack of information and lack of knowledge to a large extent. And, and, and assumptions that aren't correct. There's no doubt that what's being done for the last 30, 40, 50 years hasn't really worked. It's, it's improved things, but it's still far from effective. There's a tsunami of hearing damage claims and it's 100% preventable. The World Health Organization is concerned about it. There's a very rising tide of, of uh, hearing damage across the whole world. And there are really three simple changes that organizations can make that reduce the risk of noise induced hearing loss by around 75 to 90 percent at zero or negligible cost compared with current expenditure. So that's what we're aiming to do today in our three specialities, if you like. Um, so the, what we're talking about today is the cost of NIHL, both financial and ethical and health wise. What hasn't worked in terms of PP noise control and audiometry? Why haven't they worked? And then what does work? So the three changes that need to be made to stop people going unnecessarily deaf. So um, the one people everyone everyone knows about is noise induced hearing loss, tinnitus and tinnitus. Those are the two sort of headline topics. But as has been referenced, there's a massive increase in dementia 
Noise is the single most modif easily modified risk as far as dementia is concerned. And that completely messes up your life if you get dementia, it's fairly obvious. But there are also a lot of other health effects which Rob will talk about. There are also huge costs associated with PPE and the hassle and there's cost in terms of communication in working conditions and safety. And there's also the cost of risk assessments. We see a lot of these um, when people come to our competency courses and the quality is dire. And most of them are placebo. And all these things can be easily changed. So looking at um, the costs to people's health, let's just look at dementia to begin with because not many people know about that. Mild hearing loss doubles your chance of getting early stage dementia. Moderate hearing loss, three times the risk. Severe hearing loss, five times the risk. The NHS in the, few year, the last few years has been spending approximately half a billion with a B pounds per annum dealing with hearing loss. And it's been estimated that it costs seven billion pounds per annum to the UK uh, economy. And the insurance industry is also paying out, getting on for a half a billion pounds a year. This just all shows that noise induced hearing loss, it is not being dealt with effectively. So ask yourself risk assessments. If you look out on, on the internet, you get the impression you need to do your risk assessment. You need to remeasure everything every two years. There's a huge industry predicated on that. So companies and organizations do risk assessments every couple of years that tell them exactly what they already know. They have a problem, but nothing changes. Two thirds of those are if you're politically correct, the HSC are very politically correct, but what they mean is two thirds of those are a waste of time. They're purely placebo exercises. Hearing protection is first aid. You can get it in place very, very quickly to protect people's hearing, but it doesn't guarantee adequate protection. People think it does, but it doesn't. Noise control, people assume it's not practical or it's very, very costly, so it doesn't get done. Knowledge of modern noise control techniques is abysmal. So people don't reduce the noise levels, don't reduce the risks because they expect it to be expensive. Conventionally, audiometry is a placebo exercise in, in, in the most part because it only tells you that you've driven people deaf many, many years after it's happened. It doesn't stop you doing it in the first place. It's not useful tool as part of risk management strategy. So, but if you update all these, as we're going to talk about now, you can get rid of most of these problems. This graph is from 1996. In yellow, we have the manufacturer's data between 15 and uh, about 30 dB for plugs, earmuffs, that, ear plugs rather, that's the attenuation provided. Muffs is just over 20 dB to around 25 to 30 dB. In red is the actual measured field data that people are actually getting in the workplace. And that's between 2 and 15 dB. So you're expecting 15 to 30, you're getting between 2 and 15. And not many people know that. HSC research has said that 40% of PPE users get zero protection and 60% get not enough protection. This data has been around for years, but it's not publicized. If you're manufacturing hearing protection, you don't really want to publicize that. So did you know, if you translate that into the real world, once you get above 90 dBA, it becomes very difficult to guarantee adequate protection in the real world from PPE. Noise level is directly proportional to hearing damage risk. So cutting from noise levels from 98 to 91, you're reducing the risk by 80%. You still have to wear hearing protection, but at 98 dBA, you're pretty well doomed with conventional hearing protection. You can't guarantee adequate protection. At 91, you probably could. Reducing the noise from 94 dBA to 91 dBA, you're halving the risk. So it needs to be done. As I said before, conventional audiometry is a case of closing the stable door after the horse has bolted. It cannot detect the early stages. So earplugs, um, I would call that the Greg, Greg Wallace effect. You've all seen him, Greg Wallace in the factory, wearing hearing protection and hair nets and things. And you see his earplugs hanging out of his ears like ears like fag ends. He's be getting, going to be getting two or three dB, if that, from the attenuation. And that's the problem. You cannot know what protection people are getting from wearing earplugs. Earmuffs, less variation in fit, 
but in field attenuation, it's 10 to 17 dB, whatever protector you use, whether it's cheap or expensive. The wear rate should be 100%, and people often tell me, oh, it's 100%, it's a noise hazard zone, everyone has to wear it. But you walk through the zone, there are people not wearing it, there are people taking it in and out for brief periods of time. Removing any PPE for a cumulative nine minutes in an eight hour shift reduces your maximum attenuation you can achieve to 17 dB or less. And the killer is wear rate. X axis, eight hours a day. Y axis, how much attenuation from get your, from, you get from your hearing protection. The red line is the protection you get compared to the wear rate for earplugs. In practice, we reckon 99% wear rate is all you can ever achieve. So if you're looking at 95% of the population, that limits the maximum performance you can get from earplugs to 10 dB, and the same for earmuffs to 17 dB. Those are the maxima with a 99% wear rate, which is extraordinarily rare. As I said earlier, hearing damage risk is proportional to noise dose. So if you can get below 85, hearing protection is advisory, which is a good thing, but you really want to be below 80. 80 is not still not a safe level, as I think David or Rob will talk about later. There is still a risk to hearing. So you need to reduce the noise as far as reasonably practicable and without overprotecting. So, and a lot of organizations think if you can't get below 85 or 80, there's no point in doing noise control. But because hearing protection doesn't work nearly as well as people expect, Reducing the noise from, say, 97 to 94 dBA halves the risk and means the PPE is easier to manage and you've got more chance of protecting people. And finally, audiometric checkboxing, as Rob will point out, and he is at the sharp end, he sees people who have been seriously damaged by noise. Audiometric testing currently using conventional audiometry is a checkbox exercise. It's useless apart from motivational exercise as a risk management tool because it doesn't tell you the answer until far too late. Okay, I'd like to hand over to uh, David now to talk about um, PPE. Thanks very much, Peter. <clears throat> so we've heard a little bit about setting the scene there um, and I'm going to be talking really around that first day, that plaster on the issue, which is the PPE. And importantly, what the new generation of smart hearing protection can do to help with a new type of hearing conservation program and for managing noise exposure. So I'm going to cover first of all the challenges of noise exposure, the challenges of traditional hearing conservation programs and traditional hearing protection, then what makes hearing protection smart, what on earth does that mean, and of course what impact can this have on your hearing conservation program. But I think it's important, first of all, to really get a feel for the scale of the issue that we're actually trying to deal with here. In the UK, you've got 2.2 million people who are working in over 80 decibels of noise as a weekly average. Now, as Peter mentioned, that's the lower action value where people must be provided with hearing protection, but it's actually not mandatory to wear it. But of those 2.2, you've got 1.1 million people who are working in a weekly average of over 85 decibels. Now, that means that they are obligated to both wear the protection and be provided with it. So there's an employee and an employer responsibility. Now that's a very large proportion of the population working in harmful levels of noise. But are you aware that the Office for National Statistics says there's 12 million people in the UK living with hearing loss, disabling hearing loss? Now this is a very large proportion. This is one in six of the population. And in my previous life as an NHS clinical audiologist, I met a lot of these people and so many times I would hear that, that same old story of, I didn't wear my hearing protection at work. And we'll hear a little bit more about why that was. 12 million people are living with hearing loss. There's also another issue here, and that is the loneliness and isolation that comes from hearing loss. In the UK, we have 3.6 million people who identify the television as their main source of social interaction. Now, this is a, this is a very sad state of affairs for, uh, for any country uh, but certainly for the UK. We've got so many people that are withdrawing from their relationships with friends and family, withdrawing from the workplace and even retiring early and ultimately isolating themselves at home as a result of their hearing loss. And as we've heard referenced a couple of times, we've also got early onset dementia that if we were to prevent 
hearing loss in midlife would be able to eliminate 9% of all dementia cases. Now, this cascade of effects from noise exposure through to hearing loss, loneliness, isolation and dementia, this is where we're trying to get the plaster and do the first aid on the noise exposure and break that chain of events. So on a, it's like a, a time machine, if you like. When I was working in the NHS with people who've already lost their hearing, they all wished 20 years previous they had done something different, that they had either worn their PPE correctly or they'd said something about the noise in the environment or understood what was going to happen to them later in life. So this is what we're trying to do, break this chain. I'm going to talk very briefly, Rob will fill in some of the gaps on this. We've got three parts to our hearing system, but the part that's really important for your health is your cochlea. Within your cochlea, you have rows of hair cells, and those hair cells are what allow us to turn sound vibrations in the environment into neural signals that we understand as speech, music, laughing, and communication, and so on. And we're born with about 16,000 of these hair cells in, in each ear, and that's all you get. Now, when you expose those hair cells to noise in an environment, they end up getting damaged and broken. And first of all, you might hear things like tinnitus, a ringing in the ears when there's no external source. And that's as a result of these cells firing off spontaneously. And I was fortunate to study this for about five years during my PhD in auditory neuroscience. But it was really frustrating learning about this and realizing that something needed to be done in the workplace, because why were so many people going deaf as a result of noise exposure? And it comes down to it, it's very difficult to know when you're in that workplace, what is too much noise? Now, we all know that 100% dose as, as per the health and safety executives guidelines is equivalent to 85 decibels for eight hours. And you're probably also aware that for every three decibel increase, that's doubling the energy in the sound, which means you can only be exposed to it for half the time. Now, the challenge here is that in any standard workplace that has noise, let's take a construction site, for example, Standard equipment like um, chainsaws or paving machines, concrete piling, you're very quickly up to about 100 decibels. And at that noise level, you can only be in that for a matter of minutes before you're exceeding your daily dose allowance. Now, this is something that people working in noise get used to. And if they're not wearing their hearing protection, it's quite remarkable what could happen. So the challenge of current hearing conservation programs is that we're using technology that is effectively disjointed. Noise level meters, passive hearing protection and earplugs, noise dosimeters, noise reports and health surveillance, they just simply don't work together to actually protect people. They're sort of, a, as, as Peter mentioned, it's a checkbox exercise where we feel like we're doing what we can. But I promise you there is something more that we can do. Just thinking a moment about the impact of hearing loss in, in particular in heavy industry environments. This chart shows that if you have excellent hearing, you have a 2.4% chance of having an accident at work. If you have a lot of trouble with your hearing, the chance of that accident doubles to 4.8%. That's that 100% increase in likelihood of having an accident. Now, when you're working in a construction site or an environment where there's plants and people, that's a really big issue. If you're taking away a person's sense because they've lost their hearing, that's an issue. Now, for a moment, think what we do to a person when we provide them with passive hearing protection, whether it be foam earplugs or ear defenders over their ears. You're taking away their sense of hearing. You're giving them temporarily a lot of trouble with their hearing and inadvertently increasing their risk of an accident on site. And I think this is something that people really need to understand when it comes to passive hearing protection in particular. And we've also heard about some of the lesser known impacts of noise, dementia, birth defects, heart attacks, high blood pressure, stomach ulcers as a result of stress hormone release and reduced productivity because of course you're not able to communicate and you're constantly under stress and perhaps raising your voice and that is incredibly exhausting increasing cognitive load. So there's a whole broad range of issues beyond just hearing loss and tinnitus that comes as a result of noise exposure. So the first thing we need to do is protect people. It's that plaster over the issue, it's the first aid. Give people protection, stem the flow of harm. After that we must monitor is what we're doing working. There's no point in giving out equipment, giving out PPE if we don't know if that people are actually using it and how risks change. We know that sites change even if you feel like you have a static site. Maintenance can affect noise levels. Work patterns and work schedules can affect noise levels. So it's really important to know what's actually going on on site. And the third part of this sort of cycle is looking to improve 
you've protected people, you've stemmed the flow of harm, you know where your risks are and who's at risk and where is the source of noise and so on, then it's time to improve. And this becomes a continuous improvement cycle, which is so important. So of course, the protection part is the PPE. You can issue that very, very quickly. And the focus light ear defender that we're going to talk about in a moment is a very particular type of hearing protection that addresses some of the challenges of traditional hearing protection that's passive. On the monitoring side, this is two elements. First of all is knowing where your noise is. Are people wearing their protection and what are they actually being exposed to? And you need to understand that effectively continuously but also it's the health surveillance. So making sure that you're monitoring the leading indicators for future noise induced hearing loss. We've already heard that's not audiometry. Audiometry is a lagging indicator for deafness. You're measuring the deafness. You can't prevent deafness if that's what you're measuring. But with things like autoacoustic emissions as well here, you can get precursors to permanent hearing loss. Equally, noise exposure is of course a leading indicator for noise induced hearing loss as well. So we've got to focus on leading indicators and how we can use those to take action to improve, which is simply getting our heads together as teams in workplaces to say, how can we do things differently? Do we need three people around that noisy machinery or can it actually be one? And of course, there are so many interesting engineering opportunities for eliminating the noise at source, which Peter will talk about further as well. So just getting into the protection part, first of all, the Focus Light Ear Defender, which has been developed by Eve, has three key features. First of all, level dependent hear through. This means that when you're wearing the hearing protection, you can still hear what's going on around you at a safe level. The hearing protection level adapts to what's going on in the environment. So you're never over or under protected. The next key thing is it actually gives you 360 degree situational awareness. And it simply does that by having microphones placed where your ear canals would be on the outside of the ear cups. So it enhances and utilizes your natural ability to locate where a sound is coming from, which means you can hear people saying, watch out from behind or whatever it might be. And that's absolutely critical for holistic safety on a site. There's no point in taking away a person's sense of hearing. It gives you that 360 degree awareness. Your eyesight might give you 110 degrees, but you need 360 degrees in any hazardous environment. And the final key thing that the, this uh, smart hearing protection does is provide continuous fit testing and dosimetry. This means it actually can give you the personal attenuation rating for whoever is wearing that hearing protection. And as we'll see, whether a box rating for the SNR value is 25 or 30, that is never the value that a person is actually getting. There's always a personal attenuation rating, which takes into account their head shape, facial hair, glasses that they might be wearing. And this ear defender actually gives you that rating continuously. And it also provides those symmetry. So what noise level is actually getting through to the ear? And it also measures the dosimetry on the outside. So what noise level is in the environment as well? When we move on to monitoring, in addition to the health surveillance, we've got the peak platform. And this is where the PP starts to become smart. It's the data that's collected from that headset, noise levels, time and location that it, it enables it to be smart, giving you actual insights. So some of the features of a, of a smart platform like this include automated exposure notifications. So it's not a case anymore of watching people if they're wearing their hearing protection correctly or not. It's about getting notifications and having an awareness of what's actually going on on site. Next, you have automated site noise mapping. So you don't need to stand around with a noise level meter once every year, once every six months or whatever it might be. You have it continuously because the headsets are doing it for you. The next thing is automated PP wear rate compliance reporting. So it's so important, as we saw, to, to have the highest protection rating you can in terms of time, ideally at 99%. And to do that, you need to know, are people doing that or not? And if they're not, you can take action. And the last key thing that a smart platform like this can do is provide noise control evaluation. Once you know, once you provided the protection and then you know where your issues are, the next thing is, of course, is to intervene. Maybe it is with a toolbox talk. Maybe it is with some new hoarding. Maybe it is with some maintenance schedules and um, whatever it might be. But a system that actually has data coming continuously from it with the right notifications and alerts is enabling you to demonstrate the value, the risk reduction you have been able to achieve as a result of whatever your noise control intervention is. But the only way of doing that is with continuous and practical integrated noise monitoring. So on the platform, there are six key elements on the dashboard. 
The first one is hearing protection usage. Are people actually using it? Have they got it switched on so that they've got that situational awareness? The next thing is who's been overexposed? How many people? Then you want to have an overview of your site. Is everybody having the same issue? Is it just one or two people? The hearing protection usage time, does it match what you expect? Are you on an eight hour shift pattern or a five hour shift pattern? And does the, does the wear rate match that? Then you've got unprotected and protected events. This is a really important one because this is a key leading indicator for noise induced hearing loss. If you have a person that every day is having a series of unprotected events, which is essentially where the noise level on the inside of the ear cup matches what's on the outside, which probably means they're not wearing it correctly, you know that over years that's going to result in uh, noise induced hearing loss. The other leading indicator is protected events, because if you have a person that has 100 or 1,000 protected noise exposure events every day, it's great that they're wearing their protection and they're not being exposed to the noise, but it means you've got a risk. You're carrying a risk in the environment because you've got a noise source. And the final key leading indicator from the dashboard that you can see is a protection score. And this is simply the proportion of time that a person is in hazardous noise while they're actually wearing their protection correctly. And using these leading indicators, you can take action. You get alerts and notifications and so on. And on this platform as well, you can see person by person um, how each person is behaving and you can take action in a very specific manner. On the noise mapping side, you get a live noise map which shows you where noise is on site. It's an historic record and it's also interactive so that all that data coming from the headsets, you can actually dig into this and say, well, who was where, at what time, what were they exposed to? And if something is out of what you would expect, you can investigate further or get the notifications and alerts for your records. Importantly, the exposure insights and notifications. So while you can get the SMS and email notifications of wear rates and exposure events and so on, this is actually real data from um, a, a group of security who were working in a, a live venue in the south of England. And this was from one evening. So I want to draw your attention to a few key elements for these five people that were using it. The first one is this row of numbers here on the right. These are the dosage. This is the dosimetry for each of those individuals had they not been wearing their hearing protection. So this is the noise measured as a dose from the external side of the focus light ear defender. And you can see that in these environments, in, an, in a, a live music venue, they're getting up to a thousand percent of their dose. So if these people were not wearing their hearing protection, they really are obliterating their hearing. Now the next set of numbers to look at is this one here. Now this is the, the, the dose measured from underneath the ear cup. And you can very quickly see that you've got three people who are well below their 100% allowance for the day and two who were not. So of course, what we might want to do if we were the duty holder for these people working in this environment is we wanna say, well, first of all, I can see who they are and, and I wanna now find out what was happening. So let's look at the person who is, um, they would have been at a thousand percent of their dose, but actually they were only at 50%. Let's see what their chart looks like. So what you can see here is actually the dosimetry from their shift which ran from about 7 p.m. until about midnight. And you've got two lines. The blue line is the noise level measured on the outside of the ear defender. The green line is the noise level measured on the inside of the ear defender. And what you can see is the noise level on the inside of the ear defender, the green line, is maintained at about 80 decibels. So that's the hearing protection doing its job. Now, when the environmental sound goes from 90 decibels in the first half of the evening, it then drops down to about 85, and then in the later in the evening, it goes up to 100 decibels. The hearing protection is adapting to what the person needs and make sure that they first of all can hear what's going on around them for the situational awareness for their job, but also make sure that they're being protected at all times. Now, what about that person who had 730% of their exposure? Obviously, something else has happened here. If we look at their chart, we could see that while they were in the same venue at the same time, they were in a different location in that venue. But you can clearly see the green lines periodically through that evening matches the blue line. And very simply put, that's because they were taking off their ear defender during the evening. And how easy would it be if you got a notification that one of your colleagues had experienced 730 percent of their dose on a shift, you could say, was there something we can do or is there something that was happening that meant you had to take off your hearing protection because right now you're really obliterating those hair cells. So that just gives you a bit of an idea of what the 
the platform can do and the data from the headsets when you have smart hearing protection. And all of this is to get us to this stage of improving. It's so important that we use this data, the actual in insights, the leading indicators to get higher up on the hierarchy of controls. So what this means is that we use the last line of defense, the PPE, to get data and insights so that we can begin the continuous improvement cycle. And it's only with that data and that awareness from smart hearing protection that allows us to act and say, can we do things differently? Can we eliminate this, the, the noise at source? And so that we're not relying on that last line of defense with the PPE, because as we know, if that fails, you're gonna be exposed. And that's where the smart hearing protection comes into its own. So reaching a summary now, this is a combination of connected smart hearing protection with an actionable insights platform. And it's by using these in conjunction and the data that you get from them and then applying your wisdom of engineering controls and, and working patterns in your workplace that you can actually make a difference. So in summary, and you'll get the slides after, improved employee health and well-being as a result of preventing hearing damage and tinnitus as a result of continuous dosimetry and automated alerts. You can reduce accidents on site because you can have situational awareness and avoid near misses. You're gonna be advancing your risk management protocols because you've got ongoing assessments and automated notifications when things change or are out of spec. You're gonna be improving PPE wear rates because of the continuous fit testing and automated reporting, allowing you to intervene if something's not going right. You'll be able to improve behaviours because there's no need to bring everybody off site if it's only one out of 50 who maybe isn't wearing their hearing protection. You can actually target that person with the right information or whatever the, the intervention should be. You'll be able to evaluate your noise control intervention. So any effort you put into reducing the risk at source, you will see that re reflected in the data being measured by the smart hearing protection. And finally, you're going to be improving the sustainability of your site simply by eliminating single use plastics such as earplugs. So thank you so much for your attention. Uh, and I'm now going to hand back to Peter. Thank you, David. Let me just share my screen. I hope you can see that. OK, I'm going to be talking about I'm an engineer, so um, noise control is, is one of my things. Um, so this is step two, um, introducing effective modern noise control. The key issue with noise control is attitude, that people expect it. They just think about it. If you talk to 90 percent of people on site about noise control, they say silences and enclosures. Now, those are only a tiny proportion of the noise control technology available. And it's partly down to the fact that it's noise is a health hazard. It's a safety issue. So people consider it as a safety problem, which leads you to think about barriers and prevention of access. But noise control is not a safety issue. It's an engineering problem and should be addressed by low cost engineering techniques can often be self financing. This approach reduces project costs by between 50 and 90 percent, which means that noise control is much more likely to be introduced if it's cheap or low cost. The picture is of a grain dryer. It's an environmental noise problem, but it's the best illustrate one of the brilliant illustrations of the attitude problem. The manufacturer, when it was installed on a hill in Lincolnshire, the manufacturer uh, got complaints from miles around. And so the manufacturer approached us and we developed a unique technique to take out uh, fan noise at source by changing the aerodynamics inside the fan. Rather than adding add-on silencers, we modify the flow through the fan by fitting aerofoils, a bit like Formula One. These were fitted, complete success, no more complaints, but the farmer wouldn't pay. He said, where are the silencers? So we designed the orange add-on Helmholtz resonator silencers. They were unnecessary, but they were placebo silencers fitted to get paid because of that expectation. And this is a key thing. So if the expectation of what's possible is wrong, how do you find out what is possible? So a few things that you probably didn't know, <clears throat> that you can cut fan noise at source without using silencers by changing the way the flow goes through the fan. And that's what we specialize in. If you increase fan efficiency, you can reduce noise dramatically. 
There's also some new technology in terms of barriers. You can have barriers that are 25% fresh air to allow ventilation, but they cut the noise by 20 dB just due to the geometry of the barrier. It's very, very clever and very sophisticated and very, very effective. More conventionally, you can get uh, high performance nozzles, which are very quiet and use less compressed air. So that you can swap them out for the same activity and everyone should know this and they will actually save you money in compressed air. You can also get waterproof acoustic absorbent. Conventionally, it's rock wool and fiberglass that soaks up water and isn't very hygienic. You can now get completely hygienic and weatherproof acoustic absorbent. Also, there's you can buy a laminated metal. Laminated steel looks and sounds like steel, sa looks like steel, sounds like rubber. It's hygienic. As an engineer, I love it. It's cheap, easy to work with. And here's an example. I hope you can hear this. So one of those guides is made of laminated steel and the other is ordinary steel. Now, hoppers, chutes, guards, guides, etc. 10 to 30 dB attenuation for something that costs peanuts. Now, as an engineer, that's a very interesting product because it is cheap and it is robust. Now, sellotape. Sellotape can be extremely noisy. If you've ever been in a packing hall where they're, they're packing things in boxes, they're pulling tape at high speed automatically off lines. This is the answer. I can't hear a thing. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that's brilliant. You know, maybe I should get out more, but quiet sellotape, fantastic. And in one case, the proposal was an enclosure for £17,000 and we just switched, switched them over to quiet sellotape and the problem was solved. Um, so, Peter, I'm so yes. sorry to interrupt. We did have a little bit of an issue with the audio. Could you try it again? I don't think people okay. are able to hear. It worked let, earlier, so I'm not sure what's happened. Let me, let me sorry, go back. Sorry, more try. Let me stop sharing. Oops. I'll go back in again, come back out and go back in again. Yeah, when you um, when you share your screen, there should be an option at the top that says there is. Um, yes, there is. OK, there we yeah. go. I'll try that again. OK, let me know if this doesn't work. Right. Um, see if you can hear this. All good. Yes, we could hear that. OK, yeah. cool. it's a live show, folks. And here's the, here's <laughs> yes. the quiet, the quiet tape. OK. £17,000 cost saving. What we've done is we have put together the top 10 simple engineering noise control solutions covering a, a host of very, very common problems on most sites. Now, I can't turn you all into noise control engineers, but the key thing is to knowing what is possible so that you can say to uh, the people concerned, look, there may be alternatives. So vibration control through damping and isolation, fans, various types of fan noise control, including conventional silencing, but pneumatics, and machines, chains and tying belts, electric motors, hydraulic power packs, and how to convert existing machine guards to into acoustically effective guards, a very low cost, practical way of improving performance. And these are already available off our website. Please just download it, copy it, send it off to people and so on. Uh, complete details provided. So these are a few examples. Pneumatic noise, I'll come to that in a moment. Weighing, hopper, weighing shop, hoppers, shoots, conveyors, various things like that. You can get massive attenuations at negligible cost. Fans, I've talked about, and I'll show you an example in a moment. Big power presses, which is an absolute classic enclosure territory. Sometimes, quite often, you can get huge noise reductions very, very cheaply. Vibratory feeders used for feeding components in all sorts of industries. A few hundred pounds can give you 5 to 20 seats, 7 dB attenuation. 
Construction plant, you're stuck with screens, but you can use them to stop noise on site as well as off site. So pneumatic silencers and nozzles. Um, if you walk through any factory, you're pretty well going to be sure to find unsilenced exhaust because there's 70 or 80 different models. They break, they clog, they become a nuisance. You take them off, machine runs perfectly, but it's very, very noisy. One of the issues with silencers is that they can clog and this becomes a reputational thing is that machine you need to keep replacing the silencers, I can't be bothered, or it, the back pressure slows down the machine or messes up performance. You can have a get zero back pressure silencers that have cannot clog, so that's not an excuse. If you have multiple exhausts, just stick a pipe on it and then go down to quick fit exhausts and buy the back box off any car, that'll give you 35 to 45 dB attenuation at very low cost permanently. For nozzles, you can swap out, swap out your little copper pipes, which are used everywhere, for entraining nozzles. There's several of these available from various manufacturers. They're 10 dB quieter, which would reduce your risk by 90%. They use 20% less compressed air, so they pay for themselves very quickly. They're also intrinsically safe. So they save money, they're safer, and reduce noise. This is an example of using um, cunning aerodynamic noise control on fans. You've probably lain awake at night wondering, what do they, how do they pull off the scrap aluminium cans for Coca-Cola lines and so on? Or maybe that's just me being sad and involved in noise. Anyway, they suck them off the lines with fans. They're called um, scrap fans. They, and the, the cans pass through the fans and the fans actually chop the scrap into shreds that get recycled. This caused an environmental and occupational noise problem, serious noise problem of three systems. They were quoted £35,000 per system for enclosures lagging and silences through which the cans could pass. Our alternative best practice was to use aerodynamic modifications, which were fitted inside the fan. So this is a modified fan. It looks exactly the same as unmodified fan, but it's 22 dBA quieter and costs £3,000 as against £35,000. This is a fairly common one, weighing machines for weighing nuts, bolts, tablets, sweets, frozen Brussels sprouts or chickens, whatever. So you have a platform, you tip your product in and it gets bagged in certain weights underneath. And if there's a, an operator, they usually stand underneath. The manufacturers will supply enclosures, which give about 5 dBA off the platform, but typically increase the noise underneath where the operator is by 2 or 3 dB, because you're funneling the noise downwards. Now, we have an alternative kit, which involves the laminated steel and various other simple engineering modifications, which reduce the noise by 10 to 12 dB typically, at about 20% of the cost of the, of the enclosures provided by the manufacturers. So four times the performance at 20% of the cost. Now, the manufacturers know what we do, but they make more money out of selling enclosures. In this particular case, in addition, access and maintenance, there is no problem because it's just a machine that looks the same as, as a noisy machine. So you get cleaning. There's no, there's no problem like you have with enclosures where you have to remove the enclosure to do the cleaning. In this particular case, 94 dBA with the enclosure, 82 dBA without the enclosure and the engineering controls fitted. So PP unnecessary underneath the platform. And another one of those things, next time you're cleaning your teeth, have a look at the plastic toothpaste tube. At the end is heat welded shut. And they pass that fin between these two copper pipes with lots of holes in. It's very noisy, 94 dBA. They're going to spend a lot of money on a large enclosure. We fitted coanda nozzles, which are a bit like the entraining nozzle technology. 12 dBA off, no enclosure required. They use 20% less compressed air and they improve productivity because they the, the much less air turbulence, which interfered with productivity by knocking some of the tubes out at around 10% of the cost.
And a rather different one. Again, if you look in your car, next time you have a car serviced, the oil filter base plate on your car, this machine makes thousands and thousands and thousands of them. They were going to spend 35 grand or so or more or 40 grand on enclosure. But we discovered that most of the noise is radiated by the flywheel. It's like ringing like a giant bell. So the, the solution was the same as we they use on the Millennium Bridge. Um, it's dynamic vibration absorbers. Personally, I think they should have left them off. I think they should have charged the Millennium Bridge as a ride when people were sort of swaying back and forwards across it. That's just me. I like excitement in my life. Anyway, the solution was to fit lumps of steel on small cork gaskets to the flywheel at the right points, 10 dB, 10 dB noise reduction, 90% reduction in risk, cost 20 quid's worth of materials and a fitter for a day. So these are things that are possible, but how do you find out about them if you're not an expert? Well, we've put all our case studies on our website, open source, just search. There are also other online resources at the end of this presentation from all across the world. So we've, we've trawled the world for things you can just say, oh, how do you control, are there options to control the noise from this machine? There probably are. And also, finally, we also offer a remote control of noise service for across the world. So we have a huge database of noise control measures, engineering noise control measures across hundreds and hundreds of different types of machine. And what we can do is we can run your machine through our database. So what happens is people will send us a video clip with a smartphone, a bit of noise information they've got here, a couple of photographs, a bit of information. We can look through that, analyze the soundtrack, and say these are the options and sometimes we can say these are the costs and these would be the noise attenuations that are possible as well the processes here is basically provide a bit of noise data so a few pictures a smartphone video clip we then analyze run it through our database and decide on the best option and if you're looking instead of what you know if you've got access to the entire world of best practice which is what we try to provide then the chances are there's a simple, effective engineering noise control solution to your problem. And using technology such as WhatsApp, we can provide a virtual engineer on site if, if required as well, anywhere in the world at any time. So that's noise control. And to say there are links at the end of the presentation. I would like to hand over now to Rob Shepard, who will talk about audiometry. Thank you, Peter. Bear with me. Hopefully now you can see my screen. Good afternoon yep. to you all. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of today's webinar, along with my two esteemed colleagues, to highlight and discuss an issue that is so often considered less important than other occupational health concerns. But I think by the number of registrants we've got today uh, and we've had over the week, I think it's testament to how important it is, how important you all think it is. So thank you for your attendance. It's very, very encouraging to us. Um, my perspective is slightly different from that of my colleagues. As Mary may have mentioned, uh, I am a consultant clinician. So I have various roles. I specialize in the treatment of tinnitus and auditory health, of which Exposure to noise is one of, if not the greatest causes of injury and auditory ill health. Um, I have consulted and worked in a diverse range of noisy environments from offshore, industry, Formula One. I'm an active member of various work streams and committees, including the uh, World Health Organization's Make Listening Safe Working Group, which I enthusiastically support. Um, but clinically, I work at the sharp end, as, as Peter said. I see and I treat the people on a daily basis who have acquired noise-induced conditions. I have patients with noise-induced tinnitus who come into my clinic in tears with the distress 
it causes them. I have over the years had a number of patients threaten suicide if I cannot cure their tinnitus. So we talk about hearing loss, but actually tinnitus can often be much more devastating if it's not handled uh, correctly. And what's maddening is many of these patients have been enrolled in hearing conservation programs for years. Programs that you would hope would have meant they avoided injury. So that's why I get so frustrated and, and, and animated as David and, and Claire and others will tell you when I'm in discussions with people who don't see any point in changing how we uh, approach hearing conservation. I think for these reasons, the reasons that Peter and David mentioned already, as well as others, the traditional approach to hearing conservation doesn't work, which is now why it's time to change, why the three of us are so passionate about presenting a better way to prevent this 100% avoidable injury. But as Peter and David both already touched on, consideration of noise exposure is so much more than just prevention of hearing problems and tinnitus, which on their own are as, are as important anyway. Um, but we need to consider the secondary health concerns, the, the increased risk of dementia, a very hot topic for us in healthcare. Papers published in the past few years have supported what we in audiology have suspected for some time, that the presence of hearing loss may encourage or uh, be linked in some way to cognitive decline, to the increased risk of suffering from dementia. Research published in The Lancet in 2020 outlines that there are 12 modifiable risk factors, things that we can change throughout a person's life course that contributes to that risk. And those robust epidemiological studies have confirmed that the one that results in the greatest risk of cognitive decline is hearing loss. So hearing loss, out of all the things that we can change, hearing loss results in the biggest risk of suffering from dementia. And figures suggest that nearly 4.5 million people suffer from dementia due to hearing loss. Now, there are uh, other secondary health concerns that David mentioned resulting from exposure to sound, increased risk of cardiovascular disease, premature death, falling in later life, hypertension, strokes, ulcers. So reducing the causes of uh, any potential hearing loss, reducing exposure to hazardous sound is increasingly important. So we all know that exposure or listening to loud sound or sa uh, sorry loud noise uh, or sound it doesn't have to be unwanted or unpleasant to cause injury generally exposure to sound unless very loud or explosive noise it doesn't cause any pain there's no pool of blood there's no broken bones there's no visible injury the damage is gradual and insidious and it would be impossible to recognize someone just by looking at them to see if they've got noise induced injury. This image is a little um, misleading because in the vast majority of cases, people are completely oblivious to the injury they're suffering. You don't see it and you don't feel it. Someone with noise induced injury looks like somebody else without noise induced injury, which it may be why it's not given the same uh, recognition or priority as other concerns for health. And it's not until that noise induced injury has been present for some considerable time and the damage has accumulated and become progressive enough that the conventional hearing test, if you're lucky, is going to pick it up. So we can't rely on the same old traditional approach that over the last 30 years has not been effective. We need to provide developed procedures, tangible, improved initiatives in how we preserve our health and those that we're responsible for. Now, in the past, we've been limited by the resources and the understanding that we've had, but now, now we can harness and employ 
new procedures as part of a complete and cohesive auditory health conservation program. Noise control, intuitive PPE, new resources, new technologies for a 21st century approach. Now, I think that we understand some consider uh, hearing conservation and certainly health surveillance, especially to be a box ticking exercise and not actually about preventing injury. And I would suggest that this new approach may not be for them. This is for those practitioners, professionals like yourselves, service providers, organizations, individuals who genuinely want to preserve the health of their employees, genuinely want to be informed on and embrace best practice. So the element of a cohesive and effective program that I want to uh, speak about with you today is the health surveillance test. The aspect that I've been researching and developing and championing for over 25 years now. Why is health surveillance so important? How can that help us prevent the noise-induced tinnitus that I was mentioning? How can it help reduce the numbers of people that are devastated by these conditions? Well, without health surveillance, we don't actually know if the strategies that we've put in place to protect against noise are actually working. We don't know if we're getting value for money or return on investment. We don't know if the hearing protection is actually protecting, and we don't know if people's hearing is being injured. Good health surveillance ties everything together. So the way that we can find out if we're investing in effective health programs is by utilizing health surveillance. If when we measure hearing status, we demonstrate uh, injury or reduced function, then it indicates the control processes. Those, those strategies are not working successfully and we're not getting a proper return on investment. David mentioned, um, and we haven't got time, I'm afraid, to, to go through a lengthy and I'm sure enjoyable uh, explanation about how our hearing works and how it's damaged by sound. But remember, the one most vulnerable structure in our auditory system are the outer hair cells in the cochlea. These cell structures we have known for decades are the ones first injured by exposure to risk factors, all types of noise workplace noise, environmental noise, recreational noise, uh, but also chemical factors, solvents, carbon monoxide, some medications, they will all first damage the outer hair cells in the cochlea. So the outer hair cells are the first site of injury. And remember that we can lose function of a significant percentage of those outer hair cells, maybe 30 to 50% of those cells before hearing loss becomes measurable on the traditional hearing test, the audiogram. But with this um, hidden damage, hidden loss, we still will have difficulties with our hearing, maybe listening to speech, following conversation in a noisy pub, tinnitus, hyperacusis. So we need a true and effective approach to health surveillance to fulfill certain objectives. Firstly, we need to um, highlight any effect from damaging exposure as quickly as we possibly can so we can prevent injury. Obviously, we don't want to wait until the injury has become progressive. We want to stop it as soon as we can. Secondly, we need to demonstrate how effective control processes and strategies have been. So if the test shows reduced health, then these processes aren't working. And in an early stage, proactive actions can be taken to improve and prevent hearing loss. Excuse me. In addition, and what's so often forgotten about, is that we can use the test to inform and motivate behavioral change. So the individual is vigilant in protecting their health. They are reducing noise at source. They are um, avoiding loud sounds. They're wearing their hearing protection as much as they need to. I've been testing people's hearing now for coming up to 37 years. And I know 
how vitally useful various tests are and what they show us and what they don't show us. The traditional approach to rely in isolation on the audiogram is unfair. Audiometry is unable to achieve all of the objectives I've just mentioned. It's a subjective behavioral test where a person being tested must concentrate and respond accurately and genuinely to sounds every time they, they're heard. This behavioral procedure was first developed in the mid 1800s. Alexander Graham Bell patented the audiometer in the 1870s. So by no means is audiometry a new or cutting edge test procedure. But audiometry is still an extremely useful test and we don't want to get rid of it. We must continue to make use of it in a, in a suitable way. I use it and I need it day in, day out to measure people's hearing loss. But I think what we should never forget is the purpose of a um, hearing conservation program is to prevent hearing loss, not to measure it. And logically, audiometry used in isolation as a test that measures hearing loss only gives us a useful result when it fails to prevent that loss. So after uh, many years of research by me and others around the world, we're now able to harness a test that does what we need it to do, used along with and uh, complementing the traditional audiogram by using the evidence-based tried and tested procedure called autoacoustic emissions. This test has been used for 30 years plus in most hospitals, certainly in the UK and many around the world, almost exclusively to test the hearing of newborn babies. It's quick, it's reliable, it only takes two or three minutes. Um, it's non-invasive, it can be performed in a quiet environment, it doesn't demand soundproof uh, rooms such as, as, as the audiogram does. It doesn't need a response from the person being tested, it's completely objective, and it measures the function of only one structure in the auditory system, the first structure to be damaged by loud sound, the outer hair cells. So we have a test at our disposal that will show us at the very earliest opportunity the evidence of reduced function of our inner ear, of our cochlea, following exposure before we lose our hearing. So we can uh, be proactive and we can prevent hearing loss. We can fulfill all of these requirements for a health surveillance test. This is a game changing development. And along with the initiatives that uh, Peter and David have mentioned, if we release the potential of OEEs, we can use it in the workplace to assess as an early leading indicator of exposure. We can motivate with easily understandable information to prevent hearing loss and the problems associated with it. So we could say last year you had 5% damage, this year you've got 20% damage. Now your hearing hasn't been changed, you still have robust hearing, but something is causing some deterioration. So let's see, what we can do before you actually have hearing loss. So proactive occupational healthcare. When I'm talking about health surveillance, um, one of the analogies that I use is one given to me by one of my clinical oncology colleagues. Uh, when we were discussing the things that we do, the work that we do, uh, she really understood the gravity of these developments. And she described it like this. She said, if we are creating and providing a cancer screening prevention service, and we have two tests at our disposal, we have a quick objective test that screens for um, proteins or hormones released in the blood by abnormal precancerous cells, we can then take measures to prevent cancer. 
before it starts. Or we have a traditional X-ray developed in the 1800s that can measure a cancerous tumor once it's got big enough to show up on an image. Which one would you use? I personally want to use every tool at my disposal to screen for noise exposure, prevent injury, avoid hearing loss. Or we don't have to, we don't have to change. We can carry on with the same approach that we have done for the last 30 years. I understand that generally, as people, we don't like change. We're comfortable with what we know. We're comfortable with tradition. But I think with comfort comes complacency and complacency is the enemy of progress. If we do not progress, if we do not change the paradigm that we use in our approach to the prevalence of uh, noise-induced injuries, then injuries to auditory health will continue to rise. I think it was Henry Ford that said, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. So today's presentation is a result of um, the three of us and our passion for conserving people's hearing health. As Peter says, we've known each other for a number of years. Our orbits have collided numerous times in the various uh, committees and associations that we support. But I think over time that we have recognized each other's same genuine passion and that we're experts in our fields. Peter in noise control, David with PPE and myself with health surveillance. So uh, more recently, we've realized that collaborating and combining our skill sets means that we can offer and we can advise and we can educate on the most comprehensive and effective hearing conservation program available anywhere. And I mean anywhere. There are some resources here, um, but as Peter said and David said, we will be making a PDF copy of our presentation. So um, we'll be happy to send that to you. If you'd like to email any of us, then we'll certainly provide you with that. We are still in the initial genesis phase of our collaboration, uh, but the next step to our work is that we're planning a face-to-face -face workshop where we can go into more detail on the various um, training on different aspects. So to all interested parties, uh, we can give them more information on the various things that will complement a 21st century approach. So if any of you are interested in joining us on that journey, then please click the link below and we will be happy to provide you with information on that workshop. So thank you for that. Uh, now I hope you've got some questions for us. And Mary, can I ask you to please mediate those questions? Yes, of course. Uh, let me just turn my audio back on here. Yes, happily. I've been keeping track whilst you guys were speaking and uh, clearly everybody was very engaged because I I have a lot of questions here. I'm actually a little bit worried about time. <laughs> I'm like, how are we going to get through all this? But um, first and foremost, round of applause to our three presenters. That was excellent. Very, very informative. And I think that was just like the perfect three people to come together and talk about um, noise risk reduction. So th thank you guys so much. Very, very fascinating. So uh, what I'm going to do, you know what? I I think just while we're kind of in the mindset of health surveillance, I was going to go into your, you have a couple of questions here, Rob. I was thinking um, maybe starting with you and then I'll, I'm going to kind of go in between David and, and Peter and yourself and, and you know, uh, keep kind of hopping between the three of you. So first one for you, Rob. Now, this was quite an interesting discussion going on in the chat box and I wanted to to bring this up and see your take on it. So somebody has this problem. So let me, let me um, read this out. So they say our occupational health consultants ask for a risk assessment for each staff member regarding noise exposure to determine if our request for health surveillance is necessary they will not accept noise reports which is very frustrating we have a number of staff awaiting health surveillance while they review our request they also state that if controls are in place including hearing protection then no there's no requirement for health surveillance so what can you say about that, Rob, to help out? 
Well, no. I mean, if, if noise levels indicate that they fall um, above the action levels, then they're legally obliged to provide health surveillance. That's the short answer. So My suggestion would be to change your supplier. <laughs> Indeed. But no, they, they legally must. That's one of the one of the uh, outline duties in the noise at work regulations. So there you go. <laughs> if um, the person asking that question, I, I'm sure Rob, you would be happy enough to talk to them one on one. Yeah, so want to get in contact. Uh, OK, so I'm going to jump to Dave next. Dave, you had a few questions about your device. So people asking, are they intrinsically safe? Uh, if not, that will mean they can't be used in a certain number of noisy industries. And uh, they also asked about the robust robustness of your devices. So can they, um, you know, sustain a few knocks? Yeah, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, they're not ATEC certified or, or IECX, so they're not in use in flammable or explosive environments today. And um, they have been designed with it in mind, but they have not been tested and certified to that uh, zone zero, zone one or two. But we're on our way to that. Um, in terms of what was the second part of that, Mary? Oh, robustness. So can Robust they? Yeah. Yeah. So we've got um, about three thousand of these in the field. Uh, some of them have been out there for over two years now. Um, so, and this is in harsh construction environments and harsh manufacturing environments. Um, on the one side, they come with a one-year guarantee. On the other side, they're designed to last for two years. Um, the first thing that goes after two years is typically the the rechargeable battery. Uh, but certainly they are robust enough to last in a harsh environment for, for two years. Great, thank you. I'll go over to Peter next. So uh, I found this one quite interesting. So in, in noise dosimetry, should you allow for the wearer's own voice, particularly, particularly in background sound levels below 80? That's an interesting one. Um, if you're below 80, it, it, the trouble is voice is depends on how loud you shout. Uh, and one of the classic ones, which is David's headsets get round, is people taking their earmuff off to shout. Now, if you shout at the same volume you would without wearing hearing protection when you're we wearing hearing protection, people can hear you better because the background noise has been reduced and your comprehension is improved. It's like uh, fighter pilots, it's been proven for them hearing warning signals and comprehension and so on. The problem is when you've got hearing, passive hearing protection on, you can hear your own voice. So you stop shouting so people can't hear you. Now, dissymmetry, it, the voice is directional. So if you're wearing a conventional dissimeter, you can shout across it and that will give you an incredibly high level sometimes. But Conventional dissymmetry is not that accurate. One to six dB out, usually reading high. So there's all sorts of things you have to you have to you you can't just use a one off dissymmetry reading to say there's an issue. You have to do it over a period of time, which is not standard practice for an awful lot of noise surveys. It's just one off. Mm. OK, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, back over to you, Rob. So they would like to know your opinion on using brown noise to temporarily alleviate tinnitus. Tinnitus is different for every patient. There are, there are a thousand and one different patients and a thousand and one different tinnituses. Um, the use of noise and sound enrichment can sometimes help for some people and others not. We have to, we have to assess everybody holistically and as an individual. So if I was to see someone with regards to tinnitus, I would undertake a full battery of tests and an holistic uh, assessment of their particular condition to find out what their contributing factors are. It's seldomly one thing, but for some people, sound enrichment of certain sounds can desensitize the brain's oversensitivity to noise. So provision, what we used to call in the old, old days, white. Um, Tinnitus masking with the provision of white noise or brown noise or pink noise can help you desensitize the, the primal part of your brain that is focusing on tinnitus, as long as that's done with appropriate directive counseling. So the short answer is yes, maybe. The long answer is depends on the individual. Wonderful. Thank you. 
All right, uh, next one for you, Dave. So there was a question about, you know, the 4 dB real world correction that HSE advises. Um, so their question, this this then puts into conflict the requirement of the HSE to prevent overprotection, which in reality will not occur due to the fact that the PPE gives far less protection than predicted. So mm -hmm. what do you think of that and that four decibel correction factor? Um, so th this is why the only way to actually know is with fit testing. Um, and the only way to do that in a meaningful and practical way is to have it integrated into the hearing protection. Um, so there's, it, it's, a, it's a really good question and it's solved by level dependent electronic ear defenders, which are no more costly than a pair of passive uh, plastic ear defenders over the years. Um, but it's, it's solved by fit testing and, and uh, really almost ignoring the single number rating on a, on a pair of ear defenders and saying, well, what protection are we actually getting? We only know that with, with fit testing. The a quick aside on that, the HSC 4 dBA is the, th th it's 4 dB reduction is the theoretical performance. Wear rate completely trumps that. Mm -hmm. You know, if you only wear it half the time, you get 3 dB, no matter what you, what, what the uh, NNR is for the hearing protection. Mm -hmm. Oh, good point. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I have a question, we have one next about autotoxic effects. So I have one question here for you, Peter, but also leads into a question for Rob. So I'll, I'll start with yours first, Peter. So they're asking about safety data sheets. You know, do they need to say that the chemical can cause autotoxic effects? Um, a lot of people in the chat were saying, no, they've never seen this. It's not a GHS hazard statement. So there wouldn't be an SDS, um, you know, putting that information in unless the manufacturer reporter chooses to add it in. So just what are your thoughts around that? Should, should well, that be It's something? really a question for Rob, but the, as far as the risk assessment is concerned, then yeah, if you're using ototoxic substances, then that needs to be included in the risk assessment. I have never, ever seen that in a noise assessment, and I have seen hundreds, ever, not even then. Take it away, Rob. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. Ototoxicity, so if someone's working in a noisy in a noisy environment that uses solvents, then that would increase their sensitivity and that should be taken into account and factored into any uh, risk assessment. So definitely, yeah. Awesome. Uh, and uh, just sort of a, a follow on question for that for you, Rob, is what are your thoughts on using OEA for monitoring exposure to autotoxic chemicals? OAE? Certainly, yeah, oh, um, definitely. Wait, so, so, so OAEs are used um, for the monitoring of ototoxicity with various medications in some hospitals. So, yeah, anything that's going to affect, anything that's going to be a risk and affect the performance of the outer hair cells, OAEs is definitely, it's the only test that we have available to us that specifically measures the function of the outer hair cells. So, with ototoxicity, whether it's noise, whether it's medication, whether it's solvents, it's the best test, the best leading indicator of exposure to that risk factor. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Dave, you're up next. I'm just I'm just hammering through these because we only have a couple more minutes. Um, but I mean, if people are you know willing and ready to to stay with us for maybe an extra five ten minutes or so, yeah, we can get through start. more. So <laughs> that's okay. But uh, you you next, David. So. Um, Right. So there, well, during your presentation, just talking about your your device. So, would this actually work for staff who are only periodically exposed to noise throughout the day due to certain tasks? So, for example, you know, only wearing hearing protection for those specific tasks. This seems to only work for continuous use. Um, like we've heard, every site is is different. But it, it, on the one hand active level dependent can be very good for sporadic noise because it means that in the same way that if you're always wearing high vis or glasses or a hard hat you don't wait until the the risk is present you wear it because there is the risk of that happening so you can make the case that they should wear it all the time of course that's not necessarily going to be comfortable all the time or practical um, and so it's about making sure you have a baseline understanding so wear the protection as you would and then looking at the data to say you think know, monitoring if you're always below 100% daily allowance, in theory, that's that's a safe, that's that's not a bad place to be. Um, but if you're doing, you know, up down, up down, while the sporadic noise comes and goes, and at the end of a shift you are overexposed, something needs to change. 
But uh, you know, the only way you'll know that is by having that continuous uh, monitoring. But with the level dependency, as I say, it will just kick in with the right level of protection when the noise comes in without any risk to your, your hearing in the first place. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Right, let's find one for Peter. Peter, you have a ton here, so <laughs> I'll do my best. Um, right, so they were asking for some, they liked your illustrations for static machinery, but they were wondering if you could recommend any engineering improvements for portable machines, like hedge trimmers or mowers. What are your thoughts? Much more difficult, and I wish the manufacturers would uh, take account of this. It's it's something we all we always push for in terms of risk assessment is have a purchasing policy and to put the pressure on manufacturers and i like to compare this with hand on vibration which you also deal with is that over the last 10 years because there is no ppe in hand on vibration there is no ppe zero the manufacturers work under a lot of pressure to develop low vibration kit and the vibration from a lot of high vibration tools has dramatically reduced over the last 10 or 12 years. Whereas that hasn't happened with noise because the manufacturer says safe use requires PPE. A lot of this plant, you could quite easily make it a lot quieter at the design stage. It's much more difficult with portable plant to do it retrospectively. Having said that, we have had success with pneumatic tools. We have had some success, but it's, it's quite rare because of just the sheer practicalities. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Rob, you're getting some questions here about OAE. So I'll go over to you next. What are the obstacles to getting OAE becoming the new medical surveillance standard? Yeah, as I say, people um, are not readily, some people love it. You know, I think when you've explained the whole benefits of the limitations with conventional audiometry and how it cannot logically give us early indication of exposure. And compared to OEs, that gives us that opportunity to proactively prevent injury, they get it. But again, unless you have the opportunity to explain that fully to people, if they don't have that full understanding, they will stick with the traditional approach. What we need is organizations like the HSE to recognize the benefits of developing here in conservation. We don't want to completely get rid of previous procedures. We want to complement them. We want to develop them. We want to evolve here in conservation. I think if the HSE and other um, worldwide organizations in, in, responsible for safety get behind it, then obviously the uptake will be much greater. But I think the more that people, when they are commissioning services from service providers, they need to be asking those service providers, why are you only doing this? Why are you not doing OAEs? Why are you not providing a service that's going to better pro protect all our employees? Mm -hmm. Because the bottom line will be the bottom line. When it's money, people will develop the service they provide. Mm -hmm. in, in a more general thing, I mean, when I had a chat, first got to know Rob, looking at OAEs, I just thought this is a no brainer. You know, it, it it's, it gives you immediate feedback for risk assessments and you know, to assess the performance of your hearing protection and your hearing conservation program immediately. Um, but the problem is trying to persuade, I've tried to persuade manufacturers to produce low cost hardware. Um, and so far I've failed because because they sell to um, people like Rob, that that's clinical equipment, which is different from an industrial version, which could be a fraction of the price but and sell thousands but at the moment they sell hundreds and that's their their model and it's a difficult one but if that can be cracked then there's no reason i mean technically i've designed the hardware and software you could do it on any laptop with a us sounded usb sound card in principle we are it's frustrating the, yeah manufacturers have improved we are getting handheld versions so it's improving all the time thank you uh, right, I have a few more for Peter, so I'm, I'm going to slam you a little bit uh, here now, Peter. Go on then. <laughs> so, right, one person was is talking about the textile industry. So they say, having worked with the textile industry for 30 years and not seeing much in the way of reduction in noise from processes such as weaving, spinning, uh, winding, and twisting, do you have any ideas? 
Some of those are amenable to engineering noise control and some aren't. It's an individual case. Um, we have dealt with some of them and in some cases been very successful for parts of the process, but some of the process it, you're just doomed. And we will issue a you are doomed certificate. There's nothing practical you can do in the way of noise control. So hearing protection is going to be the only thing you can do, which is as required by the regulations. Strictly speaking, you're not allowed to use PP unless you can prove long term, unless you can prove you can't reduce the risk. So we will give you you are doomed certificate for parts of the textile industry kit, unfortunately. If it was designed in in the first place, then yes, but not retrospectively. Excellent. OK, um, I might go back to you, Rob, because there are actually quite a few questions coming in about OA, uh, OAE. <laughs> so if, if I just throw a few more at you, if that's all right, that seems that, to be can, can I just, can I, can I just my share my screen, put our contact details up there? So if we so, haven't got time to answer all these questions, People can certainly email us. So, and can I also just jump in? Can I just jump in and say, uh, just to reiterate what Rob said earlier, that we do. If there is interest in this sort of holistic approach, we want, we would like to run a half day or full day workshop where we can really get into answering these questions in much more detail. Um, so, all you need to do is just register your interest because we, you know, we'll obviously only do it if there is interest for it. I'll share the link again, and it will also be in the presentation when it comes in. But uh, just wanted to make sure we we say that again. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, it's I. If they, these questions keep popping up about um, OAE. There's also quite a few questions about specific engineering controls for for various industries. So really, you guys, this is another webinar. This is like a whole. I mean, conference <laughs> practically. So, um, well, how about should we carry on t for a few more minutes? If everybody, if, if people are still logged on and keen, I'll I'll keep going if that's okay. Uh. So, so Rob, would would you like these couple of? Oh wait, yeah, yeah. okay, okay, <laughs> right, right, um, right. So, OAE testing is the way to go, but it'll open up a can of worms. So, when hearing loss is shown, when the traditional tests were showing all was well, um, any thoughts on how that will be managed? Sorry, I didn't quite understand the question. So, oh, OAE is the way to go. Yeah, so so when hearing loss is um, shown via the traditional tests yeah. um, and if showing everything was well, and I think what they mean is then then OAE comes into place, you know, and it's um, showing a difference there. How how is that difference going to be managed? I think that's what it's, it's saying. So are you saying hearing loss is shown on an audiogram or not? No, not shown. So no okay. no hearing loss on an audiogram, but okay. damage shown on OAE. So again, this is this is where proactive action can take be taken, and, and the people in charge of that health and safety for that individual can say, okay, what's going on with that environment? So if we're able to use technology like uh, David's products, we can see whether they're actually vigilant in wearing their hearing protection. If if we're looking at noise controls, we can assess the whole environment to see whether they are effectively protecting their hearing. But if if they are doing everything they possibly can within the workplace, we can look outside the workplace because it may well be that their hearing is being affected by non-vocational exposure. So are they going to loud concerts? Are, are they going to um, are they exposed to noise on the tube every day going to work? So what what OAE's does, it's a screening indicator of of that exposure. And so action can be taken. It doesn't. It's it's so if, if the hearing remains the same, then we need to look at all those other factors before the hearing loss starts to drop. Let's be blunt here. If you get an audiogram that shows it's normal and the OAE set says there's damp that there's progressive damage, you go with the OAE because yeah. there is damage. It just doesn't show up yet in this standard audiogram because it's not going to show up until it's so serious that it's going to mess someone's life up. Yeah. And that's the trouble. Conventionally, we have waited to, for that, as as Peter said, we've waited for the horse to bolt and then we shut the door. We well, let's use let's react. use let's use your metaphor, Rob. We're waiting until the tumor has grown big enough so we can detect it with our crude instrumentation. Yeah. Oh dear, dear, dear. All right, thank you very much. Um, so, I mean, I do, I don't want to go too far over on time because we could just be here all day talking and I think there definitely needs to be a follow up webinar. Uh, there, there was more questions for you, Peter, about glass recycling, 
engineering controls, controls in construction for um, lance attached to compressor to blow out between the rebar before pouring con concrete. And they're having you know problems with reducing If people can contact me or, or whatever, we can have yeah. these conversations offline. That's probably best. Yes, they're very specific. So, but no, I thank everybody for their wonderful questions. I, I hope I covered most of them. I'm so sorry if I didn't get to every single one of your questions, but um, we probably all have kids to pick up in a minute, so <laughs> I shouldn't take too long. But what I will do really quickly, I'm going to share my screen if that's okay so earlier I was talking about UKHCA um, so just if you're interested they they are having a hearing cons hearing conservation conference on November 22nd so what I'm gonna do I'm gonna bring up here is a QR code right here and if you scan it it'll lead you to the information and um you can join their mailing list. So please do get involved with UKHCA as well if, if you're interested. And, um, you know, if you like this webinar, you'll very likely enjoy the conference they have planned for November. So, <laughs> yes. Excellent. Well, round of applause again to the speakers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wonderful. But I definitely, definitely are most popular webinar ever so it's just amazing um thank you for everybody who was involved uh thank you Gans, for helping promote it as well <laughs> i have to give you a well, shout thank out. you for thank you for organizing it mary thank oh you. that's thank the, you, mary. honestly yeah thank you very much mary no 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 you guys do the hard work so <laughs> no no wonderful and uh, i'm sure we will be back in contact again soon to arrange a follow-up webinar i hope so <laughs> excellent okay i'll let you all go and thank you all so much for joining Take care, stay safe. Thank you. Okay, Bye -bye. cheers. Bye-bye.